Pete Wishart. Very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I also sympathise with the Secretary of State? And I think we were all distressed when we heard the news of his son over Christmas, and we wish him all the very best for his recovery. And we do, of course, enjoy him at the dispatch. Well, that was a bravura performance by the Secretary of State. <laughs> Such a, a comedy turn, and you referenced Tommy <laughs> Cooper. But I, I think of more of as a Frank Carson, because it's the way he tells them, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> the one line that I enjoyed best out of all of this, and it was the way he told it, the EU will look on enviously at the UK with this <laughs> Brexit. <laughs> now, that was the best killer line in that speech, because you could almost hear the shrieks of laughter coming across the North Sea in the English Channel as they observed the plight Absolutely. of this pitiful nation. It's not the fact that they're envious of this, they're actually feeling sorry for us that we've ended in this pitiful state, and if any of them are even thinking about following the example of the United <laughs> Kingdom, they will look at this chaotic government and decide never in a million years will we do this. It is the yeah, best yeah. example to any other nation about never ever to indulge and engage in such an action. <laughs> Can I say, Mr Speaker, I, I loathe their Brexit. I loathe it totally and utterly. From the, oh, the self-defeating, isolating, isolating ugliness of the whole project to the all-consuming chaotic cluelessness to the disgusting way that they're treating the 3.6 million EU nationals yeah, that are amongst yeah. our friends, our colleagues yeah. and our family members. I despair at what they are doing. And I observe and look at their Brexit deal and I see no redeeming qualities or feature to what this <laughs> government are doing with this absurd Brexit. And the fact that my country so overwhelmingly rejected this Brexit makes me even despair of what this government is doing even more. Now, the only reason they tell us that we should be supporting this paltry document is because it's better than a no-deal. <laughs> Mr Speaker, my big toe's better than a no-deal. My broken finger is better <laughs> than a no-deal. But I'm not asking the House to support either of these personal <laughs> artefacts. What vision, what ambition, vote for the Prime Minister's deal because it's better than no deal. And that is the only reason that we seem yeah, to be yeah. given in right. successive yeah. speeches from government supporters and front bench about why we should be doing this. I, yes, I'll give you the Thank you, Mr Speaker. I mean, that's a gross generalisation. The reality is that 52% of this country voted to leave, and that's what this deal does. But also importantly, 48% did not. And this deal will actually see us continue with our relationship with the EU and, in fact, deepen it in many regards. It doesn't even start to deepen it. Doesn't need to, it doesn't need to address these points to me. I'm beyond redemption when it comes to the honourable gentleman. Where he should be turning his attention is to some of his honourable friends and colleagues in these benches. And I invite him to do that. And I think they're all thoroughly looking forward to the honourable gentleman's intervention. So he'd maybe be a bit more fruitful with them than he's likely to be with me. Because I'm going to go on to explain why this deal is totally and absolutely and utterly unacceptable to me, to my constituents and to the vast majority of the Scottish people. Because I've never seen an example where it's been the main policy intention of a government Government to intentionally impoverish the people that they're notionally there to serve with such chaotic abandon. And when the history books judge this little period of British history in the late teens in this century, it will only ever conclude that this is the greatest example of political, cultural and economic self-harm that's ever been committed by a nation unto a nation. And the fact that we've got to this point will be forever remembered as the greatest single failure of any modern government in post-war history. Yeah, yeah. And do you remember why we're doing this? Do you remember why all this started? Laughingly, it was supposed to heal the divisions within the Conservative <laughs> Party on the issue of the European Union. <laughs> ten out of ten for that, Mr Speaker. What an absolute and resounding success. Not only have they further divided the rotten party, they've gone and divided a nation and then taken that nation to the very brink. And now, of course, we observe the abyss on the other side of that brink in all of its grotesque horrors. Now, if we look at the Brexit clock, 
I was going to move on, but yes, I'll give way to the honourable ladies. I like, quite like her. For giving way. I'm slightly confused. Um, does the honourable gentleman object to referenda or just the results of referenda? This is where we are with the Conservative Party when they're asking banal and stupid questions such as this. <laughs> now, now, OK, she asked about referendums. Let, let, let me tell her about referendums. We've had two referendums in Scotland, right? The first referendum, the people of Scotland voted to remain within the United Kingdom. Yeah. Now, they like that. And what we've got is Scotland is still part of the United Kingdom. What we therefore then had was a referendum on EU membership, yeah. where the nation, the nation of Scotland uh -huh. voted overwhelmingly to remain. Yes. We have not got what we have wanted in here, this here. referendum. Yep. And what that therefore means is that we have a nation completely and utterly alienated to what the Brexit Tories are doing yep. to us. Yep. And that is a difficulty yep. issue. Yep. At some point they're going to have to confront, uh -huh. and at just at some point the Scottish people are going to have to make some sort of constitutional assessment about because this cannot stand. We cannot have a nation being taken out of a union that it values and cherishes against the national collective will of the people of that yeah, nation. Yeah, I give way yeah, to the yeah, Chief Brexiteer, yeah, yeah. the newly Sir John Redwood. <laughs> I'm very, very grateful. Can he explain why it is that he thinks uh, a decision to withdraw from the European Union is, is nasty and, and inward looking, and yet a uh, a decision to withdraw Scotland from the United Kingdom is the opposite of that. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell the Honourable Gentleman quite candidly about this. You, the, 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 the EU referendum had at its very core, the cold beating heart of the EU referendum was the case of isolationism and immigration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was about stopping yeah. people coming to this country. Yeah, that yeah. was what defined Absolutely. every single one. No, I won't give way just now. Yeah. It was what defined every yeah. single case for the rotten Brexit. Everything yeah. was yeah. referenced about ending freedom of movement. Yeah. It's triumphed as the great prize of this deal yeah. and this Brexit. What Scotland wants to do is reach out to the world, yeah. to be part yeah. of an international yeah. community, yeah. to demonstrate and show how we are internationalists, what our sense of community it is about. That is the difference between he, that the honourable gentleman's objective intention and his type of nationalism and my type of all encompassing yeah, yeah. international oh, solidarity. Yeah. And I think that defines both. Yes, I'll give it to the honourable lady. I thank the honourable gentleman very much for giving way. I just wish to make the point that coming from the area of the West Midlands, we are a massively diverse area of the country. I spent 10 years knocking on doors all over the Midlands all across Birmingham. It is nothing to do with immigration. It is to do with sovereignty. That's why people voted to leave all over the doorsteps. Come with me to the black country, to Coventry or Birmingham. Speak to voters. That's what they'll tell you. I almost wish that it was. I almost wish that it was. I wish it was that type of debate that was about sovereignty, about the great things this country to do. But all I ever saw was the disgusting and nauseating posters about immigration. Yeah. All I saw was in the right wing press about how this was required. Every time I went on to hustings with a Conservative Member of Parliament, it was all about ending freedom of movement and, and controlling yeah. immigration. It was all I heard. It was the repeated message again, again, and again. I'm very grateful to my honourable men, friend for, for giving way. He, like I, and I presume like everyone else in this chamber, got a begging email from the Prime Minister shortly before the first attempt to force this through, when it listed the benefits of her deal. And number one top of the list of the Prime Minister's reasons for supporting this deal was, was it not, ending freedom of movement. Yeah, yeah. Did Monaco Friend one. get a different set of priorities, or did you think that possibly the Prime Minister gave us a priority that we couldn't support at the top of the list and gave something different to those who now deny that the referendum yeah. is about ending freedom of movement. It was absolutely. I didn't get a correspondence minister. And I, I don't think we were even trying to debate this and contest this fact. That it's, been, it's been said by the Prime Minister and everybody that's on the feet, including yeah. the Secretary of State, the great prize of this yeah. deal, of yeah. this Brexit, is ending freedom of movement. Yeah. Now, I want to come on briefly in, in part of my deliberations to discuss the consequences of that, because it is dire for my nation, it is dire for for the businesses that are dependent upon freedom yeah, of movement, yeah. and it is absolutely appalling for the young people who will have yeah, their yeah, rights restricted yeah. when they yeah, want to. Yeah. But I want to talk about the Brexit clock because this is interesting. We're not now only at the cliff edge. 
The front wheels are starting to actually dangle over, but yet the clown shoes are still pressing on the accelerator. A no-deal Brexit is now a real possibility, and the consequences of that are becoming a reality as they try to tick, run the clock down. We know about the food shortages, we know about the running out of medicines, the turning of the southeast of England into giant lorry park, and all the real possibilities of leaving without a deal. And yet they casually prepare for it. Yet they apply millions of pounds in order to try to deal with it. They talk about it more as a more realistic prospect. Just don't worry your little British heads about it. You'll be absolutely fine if we leave without a deal. Now, a no deal may be the life work and ambition of some of the extreme Brexiteers on these benches, but there are dire consequences consequences for the constituents that we serve. They may be indulging in their, their European Union their departure fantasies, but it's our constituents that will have to pay for this. And this House is therefore absolutely right to not allow that. And that vote on Monday evening was very, very important because I think that indicates to the government, unless they didn't know, that no deal is unacceptable to the vast majority in this House. And I'm looking at some of the Scottish Conservatives. Not one of them voted against stopping a no deal and exposing their own constituents to the prospect of these appalling things of a no deal. And for that, they will pay a very heavy cost. But yes, I'll give way to the honourable gentleman. And perhaps he could tell me why he is prepared to expose his constituents of Gordon to the prospects and possibility of a no deal. And companies in Gordon are actually making preparation for Brexit. And if he really wants to avoid no deal, get behind the Prime Minister and support her deal. Because I would view the national interest. But let me ask him, what preparation is the Scottish Government, as a responsible government of Scotland, making for the possibility of no deal. Are they doing anything? I actually share an office with the Deputy First Minister, and I've seen some of the things he's had to deal with and some of the consequences this will be for Scotland. I don't think the Honourable Gentleman fully understands what's at stake here. Does he understand the idea of food shortages, the idea yeah. that there might be civil unrest, the police forces have been activated in this country yeah, to ensure that. that this will be contained and dealt with? This is the prospects for his constituents, but yet he is prepared to expose them to that. Can I just talk a little bit about my nation? Because it's great that we've got some of the Scottish Conservatives here so gay engaged in this conversation, because my country wanted absolutely nothing to do with this. We returned one... Now, I want to make a bit of progress. I'll give it to the Honourable General, because I quite like him too. We returned one member, one member of Parliament with a mandate to fulfil an EU referendum. Nearly every single one of Scotland's members of Parliament voted against the EU referendum bill. Nearly every single one of Scotland's members of Parliament voted to ensure that we would not trigger Article 50. When we were eventually obliged to have that referendum in Scotland, Scotland voted emphatically and overwhelmingly to remain within the European Union of a margin of 62 to 38, the most emphatic of any nation of the United Kingdom. And on that point, I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. To give, give away on that point, because it's often repeated, and I was waiting for the famous 62% figure to come up. But does he also recognise that a year later, in last year's, uh, general, sorry, the previous year's general election in 2017, that 56% of Scottish voters voted for either the Conservatives or Labour, who at the time at least were committed to delivering on Brexit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually intrigued. They include, I've heard the Conservatives do this before. They, they include the Labour Party in these particular figures. So if he knows what the Labour Party's intentions are in Brexit, like, he's, a lot, he's a lot further down the road than I am when it comes to these particular issues. So I think it's just been a little bit disingenuous in including a clueless Labour Party into these numbers. But can I say that even though we had the most emphatic vote in the whole United Kingdom, you would think that you know, as part of the family of nations of being asked to lead and not leave the United Kingdom, that that vote would have been taken and, and to account, that it would have been acknowledged. In fact, the exact office opposite has happened. Instead, our Remain vote has been contentiously ignored and every effort to soften the blow to our Remain nation dismissed with every proposal binned before the ink was even dry. In the process, 
We are witnessing the undermining of our political institution with a power grab and the bidding of conventions designed to protect the integrity of our Parliament. And then they had the gall to tell us four years ago that the only way Scotland could stay in the European uh-huh. Union was to vote no uh-huh. in our independence yep. referendum. Yep. Well, we now see the consequence of that. We look at the example of independent Ireland, where the weight of the EU has stood in solidarity and support of one of its members and backed it to the hilt. Compare and contrast that to dependent Scotland within the UK, whose views and interests have been ignored and whose institutions have been systematically diminished as a junior partner in this chaotic union. And Mr Speaker, this is an exclusively Tory deal. And this Brexit crisis is a crisis designed, administered and delivered by the Conservatives. Even with this last-minute overtures that they've made, they've taken no interest in working with others, of properly consulting, of considering the views of other parties or governments across the United Kingdom. This chaos is theirs to own, and it will define the Conservatives for a generation. It's a Tory Brexit, and forever and a day they are now the Brexit Tories. And as for Labour, um, Mr Speaker, I'm not even sure yet whether Labour are a party of Brexit or a party that's against Brexit. I know they've got a new position today, and I think the Secretary of State was, was actually scabbered off, as he usually does when the third party is on his feet. And isn't yeah. that massive disrespect, yeah. isn't it? The third yeah. party is on his feet, yeah. and the Secretary of State scampers out of the House. It's just so, so um, consistent with his government. And coming back to my friends in the Labour Party, I think this is the 17th position that they've had on, on Brexit. Now, they've got a policy of constructive ambiguity, and I know that's what they've tried to, to, try to create. And I have to say, uh, I'm constructively ambiguous about what the Labour's position is. And presuming the view is still to respect the result, and it's still their intention to take the UK out of the EU. And I just say a little thing, and I know I often refer to my Scottish Conservative friends, but if that's the case, that's dire for Scottish Labour, who have been shown that if they support a Brexit, support in, for Labour in Scotland falls to 15%. Yes. That is the consequences yes. for, for them. Now, I want to just refer briefly to immigration, because I covered that, and we know that freedom, ending freedom of movement is <laughs> trumped as the big prize in this country. And the sheer dishonesty of the immigration question is that they can't even bring themselves to acknowledge that what we do to EU nationals with restricted freedom of movement, the EU will do yeah. to yeah. the UK. Yeah, so. yeah. I've tried to get this out of the Prime Minister, just to accept that that is the case. Mm-hmm. What that therefore means is the rights that we've all enjoyed across this House yeah. to live, to work, to love across a continent of 27 nations, freely and without any restriction, will be denied to our young people, our children and future generations. They cannot bring themselves to acknowledge that, to look the young people of this country in the eye and tell them that this equally applies to them. If one of them wants to get to their feet and say they acknowledge that, I will happily take an intervention. They were rushing to make interventions early on. Go on. Look. There we go. Don't be shy. I'm actually great because it's a very important point and I'm generally great for giving... Uh, you know, I share some of these concerns, but does he not reflect the fact that there are parts of England which had levels of EU immigration that were extremely high, and although I as one have always welcomed uh, EU immigration, particularly from Eastern Europe and so on, it is a legitimate concern for any community faced with such high numbers to express concern about it, and that we as politicians should never be deaf to such concerns. I, I, I didn't think I heard that this will apply to the young people in his constituency as they try to possibly make their lives in Europe. Now, and, uh, that's all I wanted to hear. And I know he's got concerns about immigration. We have it in Scotland. Our, our whole population growth is dependent upon immigration. If we end freedom of movement, every single one of our businesses and our economy will take a massive hit for this. Things are different between his, nation, his constituency and my nation of Scotland. We require different things. That's why we have called repeatedly and consistently for the devolution of yeah. immigration yeah. so that we can look after his interests, just like he is looking after his interests in his constituency too. I've given away to the Honourable Gentleman, and, I'll, and, and, and I'll, I think I've given away enough, and I'm, I'm conscious that I've taken up a lot of time, so yeah. I will make a bit of, uh, of uh, progress. But what happens next? This is the really, really intriguing question. Now, like, like a trapped beast, the 
government might just try to lash out and attempt to take the whole house down with it in an attempt to punish this country for its insubordination, compromised by the contradictory tensions within its own ranks. It's, it's really rare that we get to see a glimpse of a government and party so spectacularly collapse as we've seen in the course of the past few weeks. They've lost all right and authority, and their ability to govern is almost gone. They've lost successive debates on important issues. They will lose this vote next week, and there seems nothing that they can do to avoid this. But there's two things that they could do to respond to that defeat. And one thing that they're having to do as a result of the vote yesterday is to come forward to this House with their alternative options about how they deal with this. But the two things that they could do immediately, one is to revoke Article 50, which they could do unilaterally now because of the work that was done by some of our honourable friends and colleagues. The second is a bit harder, which is to ask the European Union for an extension of Article 50 so that something could be cobbled together in the meantime in order to try and keep this alive and keep it open for debate. They have got to do one of these two things. But the important thing is how they strategically deal with the position that they are in. Now, I observe all the different outcomes that's possible to this government. None of them are good. None of them are going to work for this government. And one or each of them will make sure that some massive constituency will emerge in opposition. But one thing that we have in Scotland is their own particular solution when it comes to this. We have a way out of this Brexit crisis. We do not have to go down with this Tory ship. We can make our own decisions and relationships with Europe. And increasingly, as this government continues to collapse, as the Brexit options continue to fall in on this government, as we see the disaster of this Brexit emerging, the choice of independence for our nation will become more and more appealing. And as we go forward into this year, it will soon become the majority option of our country, and soon we will have the opportunity to foster our own sustainable relationship with the European Union. Yeah. Yeah.